I'm Jordan. And I'm Tyler. And this is the Inside Music City Podcast. Welcome to another episode of Inside Music City, where it's our job to talk to music industry professionals about the ins and outs of the music business. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful patrons. Yay! Thanks, guys. You can learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family, as well as finding a lot of behind-the-scenes content by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Inside Music City. In this episode, we talk with Eli Bishop. Eli is a fiddle player. He has toured with Maddie and Tay during the Brad Paisley tour. When I heard that we were going to be interviewing Eli for the podcast, I googled him, and it turns out that he holds the Guinness Book of World Records for most claps in 60 seconds. And we got him to show us a little demonstration and then teach us how to do it ourselves. So I hope you enjoy this episode. So Eli, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Happy to be here. Let's start out with your musical journey. Sure. Give us like the cliff notes of what you did growing up with music, um, and then up until you started getting paid for it. Sure. Well, I grew up here in Nashville. Uh, my mom is a Suzuki violin teacher. It's a, a classical you know, school of, of teaching violin. So she taught me when I was about three and a half, uh, got me started playing violin. I did the Suzuki method. I did eight out of the ten books with her. Um, she was going through the teacher training for that method while I was doing the... the uh, the method itself, and so she would practice with me every morning, basically, uh, probably about an hour a day till I was about 12 or 13, and she also had me over at Vanderbilt doing the pre-college program stuff there, so I studied pretty intensely classically up until I was about 14 over at, uh, over at Vanderbilt there, and uh, when I was in middle school and starting high school, I got interested in uh, improvising and composing more, and I was curious about jazz and bluegrass and fiddle styles, things like that, so I went and started taking lessons from this guy named Buddy Spiker, who's an amazing fiddle player in town, played on a lot of sessions uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, and the 90s too, I guess, as well. But he uh, he taught me a lot of really cool fiddle and jazz stuff that I was learning from him, then I ended up going to Berkeley and Boston for two years for college, uh, was studying jazz improvisation and video game music composition. <laughs> nice. And I, uh, <laughs> sounds fun. Yeah, then I... Um, uh, couldn't keep going there, ran out of money, so I came back here and have been in Nashville working since then. So, yeah. Did you end up getting a degree, like finishing not. a degree at all? I didn't, no. Okay. I mean, I have like a two-year certificate that says I went to school, but it's it's not a, a degree of any sort. Right. It doesn't matter about the degree, though. It matters about the accomplishments, and <laughs> you tell people that you went to Berkeley, and everyone's like, oh, okay, sure. yeah. <laughs> Besides having a mom that taught you starting at a young age and then having a drive for it, what I guess, have been some catalysts for success? Sure. Um, well, like, like I said, my, my mother taught me a lot, and my dad exposed me to a lot of different styles of music, too. They used to take me down to this place called the Station Inn downtown. Um, it's kind of a bluegrass venue. It's been there a long time. I'm actually playing there tonight. But uh, they used to bring me down there a lot when I was a little kid, and I would hear all these really great fiddle players and, and other great musicians down there performing, even when I wasn't playing that kind of music. So that was, you know, they gave me an op, uh, a very diverse upbringing with music so I was lucky to have that and uh, along the way I just had some great mentors I would meet some I'd hear these guys play and they'd just be heroes to me and so I would keep in touch with them and they would always kind of advise me along the way so that was uh, very helpful and I just always made an effort to keep in touch with those kind of people and that helped a lot. So you the Suzuki method that's yeah. that's a classical violin style mm-hmm. correct yeah um because i don't know much about fiddle playing and like the style of fiddling or blues did learning classical initially did that help transition into fiddling or is it a completely different style that you can just pick up on your own without knowing classical violin uh it is completely different but i would say my suzuki violin training helped a lot dr shinichi suzuki who started that method his whole uh, idea was that if you start children at a young age, they'll learn music like they learn their mother tongue. So you'll expose them to it. It was more of an ear training method than a reading method, though reading is a big part of it as well. But his whole idea is to teach children music at a young age so they learn it like they learn a language. And he wasn't trying to necessarily create uh, incredible musicians, per se. He was more trying to make people good people through music. He said one of his greatest accomplishments was that one of his students went on to become the, the mayor of their city or something like that. And he was 
more proud of that than anything else, you know. So that that was uh, a very nurturing method that I grew up with, and so that taught me a lot. Really developed my ear more than anything else, and gave me the the foundation of playing the instrument. And then when I was interested in other styles, I did have to um, learn some more kind of freedom things from that. You know, with with that kind of music, you don't traditionally improvise as much anymore. You don't improvise or uh, compose a lot necessarily when you're a, a classical violin student. So those were new things. I remember it being tricky to uh, <laughs> you just like have my bow not be not end up in an awkward place in my bow when I was trying to improvise. You know, you're so used to having all your fingerings and bowings and everything worked out when you're playing a piece, and then if you're doing a fiddle style, it's not at all how it's going to be. You know, so but I did get a lot from the training of that. It helped a lot. Is there a different? Does your hand grip change on the bow? As you're playing a song, because um, I I don't really know much about playing stringed instruments, but my my assumption I guess is that you hold it one way and it stays like that, and you just kind of move. Sure, yeah, it's the um, the control of the bow comes from you know it's like coming from your shoulder down to your elbow. You're not really moving that forward or backwards so much. That's not really the uh, the idea behind it there. That kind of is stationary, but that moves up and down depending on if you're on the lower string or the higher string. So that's if you're on the G string, which is your lowest string, your your arm's going to be up a little bit. You know, you don't want to have your elbow too high in the air. Ideally, um, this is real like technical nitpicking this here, but this is kind of the idea behind it. So that's kind of use you use like your the uh, height of your arm based off your shoulder, I guess, to determine what string you're on. Then from your elbow, you're going side to side to go up and down with the length of the bow, and then you also have some from the wrist there, and then the fingers do a little bit as well. So that's kind of the more minute sensitivity of it there. So um, in general, your bow hold stays the same, but there is some, some moving of the fingers as you do that. So if you're, coming, if you're coming up, getting closer down to the bottom of the bow, as they call it the frog of the bow, you would be more compressed of your fingers, and if you're going down further away, they kind of extend a little bit more. But... Okay. Very small differences along the way. So, yeah. all of that motion in your wrists and fingers and everything does that help with tone, or what does that help with? Yeah, um, helps it, with everything. I'm sure it helps with, <laughs> with a lot. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's the the overlooked part of the instrument. A lot of times, you know, a lot of the tone. Most of the, actually, all your tone is coming from. Well, most of your tone is coming from the angle of your bow against the string. And so if, you're, if you're, you have your bridge on the instrument and then the fingerboard or the fretboard, if you're talking about the guitar or fret instrument, but depending on how close your, the hair is on the bow to the bridge or how far away it is, that's going to make a big tonal difference. Also, if the hair is rotated towards or away from the bridge, those are major differences as well. So, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty important to develop a lot of control of the bow to get a good tone like that. And then, obviously, your bow speed and pressure makes a big difference as well. Is there a, a set location for your, the, the bow hair for your style of playing that you always go to, or does it change based on the song? Um, I would say, in general, for me, I, I keep a pretty consistent sound with my bow i do change some things totally depending on the style of music i'm playing but i would say that's more of like a speed of vibrato change or or a stylistic change otherwise but i i for the most part i would draw the same kind of sound with my bow now i guess i guess sometimes i might change that a little bit but that's not a a very common change for me uh the bow kind of, ideally it does rotate a little bit on the edge of the hair. Like you want the far side of the hair to be kind of facing towards the bridge. And as you're going, it kind of flattens out a little bit. And then to the other end a little bit as you come towards the tip. But that's just kind of the, the rotation of it as it's going. That's Again, that's a very small move. And not everybody plays that way either. It depends on what you're doing. If you're talking about old-time fiddle, those guys oftentimes play completely different from, from other people. But there's so many different schools on it. That's just the schooling that I learned. Sounds super interesting. You said growing up, since you started playing up until 14, you said you were practicing every day for an hour with your mother. Did you ever get bored with it? Did you ever want to stop playing? Oh, and, yeah. And if so, how how did you get over that into something that you made it more enjoyable again? Sure. Well, I was lucky that my mom like did you know make me practice every morning like that and practice with me so I could get to the point I was at before I started trying to do something else. Around that time when I was getting interested in other styles of music was because I just didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore. You know, I didn't want to play that kind of music anymore. My mom was, my, and my dad were trying to help me find something else that would be maybe interesting and keep me from quitting, you know, because it would be 
uh, kind of a waste to quit after spending that much time on an instrument. So <clears throat> listening to, you know, different things like rock music and and uh, jazz and, and bluegrass and western swing, things like that, uh, kind of helped me keep an interest in the instrument. I did have to get away from my classical studies. I mean, I quit taking my lessons at Vanderbilt. I had a great teacher over there I was studying with, and I had to, had to completely remove myself from that to do something else, to even continue doing it. And then now I've come back and really appreciate that more, and I'm able to enjoy playing that kind of music again. Unfortunately, I didn't lose a lot of my, my technical studies along the way from switching. It is, it is very easy to lose um, a lot of the things you've developed and worked on so long if you're, if you're focusing on suddenly a different style of music. So what advice would you give people that are maybe in that rut mm-hmm. of they're practicing a lot and they're just getting bored with it? What, what would you say to them? You have to find something that would be enjoyable to do with the instrument. So if you hate whatever it is you're working on at the time, you've got to go and listen and find some piece of music that really excites you that you want to learn and spend your time working on it to keep an interest with it. And then hopefully through that interest in that, you will also focus on the other things that help you become better as a musician and will keep you being able to do the things that you want to do like that. That was the hardest thing for me was finding the things that I wanted to do. And it's still, still hard, you know, sometimes you'll be playing stuff you don't want to play at all. And, uh, you might do that for months at a time and not have something, not have any gigs or any kind of music that you necessarily want to be doing. Now there's always a way to figure out something to do or something with the music that you're not enjoying. If you're doing something that's not necessarily your favorite thing to do, Ideally, you can find some way to make it more enjoyable while you're doing it. You know, maybe if it's a super easy kind of music you're playing, maybe figure out a, a harder way to play it to challenge yourself. You know, there's different things you can do with that. Or, or focus on, like, all, every little detail and try and, like, make a battle with yourself to, to get through it in a way that's, that's more exciting. But um, for me, the, the biggest thing was finding that different style of music and approaching different things and learning that. That's what kind of kept me going. Are there any styles that you tried that you just can't do? There are styles that I haven't messed with much yet that I don't necessarily have a, a huge interest in right now. Maybe someday I will. I, I'm certainly not a very good Celtic player at all. I don't know anything about that. You know, I know some people who are amazing Celtic fiddlers, and, uh, Scottish and Irish <clears throat> fiddlers. I don't know anything about doing that, so I don't even try to do that because that's pretty specific of its, in and of itself. And same with old time. I'm not really an old time fiddler. That's a very specific thing as well. Uh, I'm growing into being a, a better bluegrass player now. That was a more recent style that I adopted myself. But uh, when I when I get interested in a new style of music like that, I just try and really immerse myself in it and try and learn the tradition of it. And I usually will pick a player who I really like and just learn a lot of their solos and a lot of things they've done. And that will kind of help me grow my interest in it and get bigger with that. But... Uh, I don't know anything about a lot of different kinds of ethnic fiddling either, I guess. You know, uh, South American stuff. They've got some really interesting music in South America with fiddles. And um, same in the Middle East. I'm not a, I don't know anything about that. It's pretty complex as well. A random question that I had that has to do more with t- playing technique. Sure. Since you have the more classical background, do you play your fiddle with the end more up under your chin like a classical violinist would? Absolutely, yeah. I always, I always hold it... Um, between my, my shoulder and my chin. That was something I was taught when I was, before I even started playing the instrument, the first thing I do is give us a, basically a cereal box with a, uh, a ruler through the end of it as an emulation of, of the violin. The whole thing is just to practice putting it up on your shoulder and then putting your chin down over it and holding it there. You know, you hold it for 10 or 20 seconds and then take it down and do that for months before you even start playing. Uh, so that was part of that training. And that's so that you have freedom for your hand to move around and shift so if you're holding it with your but if you're holding it with your chin between your shoulder and your chin then you can you don't have to worry about holding it with your hand if you're holding it with your hand it's a little bit harder to shift around and stuff like that um but if it's up there you have freedom so you can you can basically let your hand off of it and put it back up and it's it's held there now you mentioned Roy Acuff holding it down basically on his uh, uh inside of his elbow there a lot of old-time guys will do that as well it's kind of interesting because you get a totally different sound off the instrument, or perceivably for, your, for yourself, you're hearing a different sound. It's right under your chin here. The sound holes are basically right next to your face. If it's down a little bit further, you have more of an idea of what the sound is being produced from a distance there. Um, a lot of old-time guys will do that, and I've seen some European guys do that as well, kind of uh, Romanian musicians I remember meeting did that. Um, 
I think it's just the evolution of the instrument and how people played it. You know, they all came from lutes, essentially, so everything evolved away from that. So some instruments are held in the lap, some are held in a weird way under your chin. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried it in your elbow? Yeah. Uh, playing there? Yeah, it's hard for me. Um, it's it's tough for me to do that. Uh, I could see why why people would do that. I see, like I said, tonally the, the difference in that. Um but also, it leaves a lot of room, for someone like me anyway, it leaves a lot of room for me to uh, potentially cause myself health issues with my wrist or something or with my, with, uh, with my fingers. You know, somebody else who's doing that, maybe they figured out a, a more comfortable way of doing that. But since that's not something I'm used to, that could give me a lot of problems. And I'm just so used to having it up here under my chin and having, you know, knowing where everything is there. Especially, especially starting from such a young age. Yeah, it's pretty. Learning it. Yeah, uh, one way it's it's hard to just ch- completely change the way you play yeah, and exactly. have it still sound good and still be able to play right. to play well. Yeah, it doesn't sound very good when I try and do it that <laughs> way. <laughs> um, I want to I want to backpedal a little bit. You said something about um, finding and meeting mentors mm-hmm. and keeping in touch with them. That's one thing that I am trying to figure out how to do. How did you go about approaching these guys and saying, "Hey"? Can you be my mentor, or did you even say those words? And how did you do that? Sure. Um, with my experience, at least with the violin world, I'm speaking about the violin world more than anything else. There were a couple guys I met along the way when I was about 12 or 13. I met this guy named Alex DePew, who's an excellent classical violin player, but he kind of went off and did his own thing. He's a great contest fiddle player as well, and he he went on to with Steve Vai as a, a rock like fiddle player with him for a while and he's pretty amazing i met him in in centennial park here in nashville when i was 12 he and another one of my teachers named billy Contreras were hanging out i wasn't taking lessons from billy yet but they were in the park just playing together and i was pretty blown away by what they were doing so my my parents bought me alex's cd and i just listened to that a bunch and pretty much learned everything off of it and then i just kept up with his schedule online he wasn't i don't think he was living in nashville at the time or maybe he was and he moved shortly afterwards but I didn't see him again until I was uh 14 so two years went by and I was just learning all his stuff and then I knew he was going to be at this fiddle contest in Alabama and I was getting interested in those things so I just kind of wrote him online and said hey I'm coming to this I met you a couple years ago I learned these things that you did I'd love to play for you if you would listen to me or maybe get a lesson from you or something like that and fortunately he was nice enough that he said yeah let's you know let's hang out we'll we'll chat and we'll see what you're doing so that was um the start of a really nice mentorship that was, well, that would have been 11 years ago or 25 now. So I would have been 12 when I first met him and then 14 when I met him again. And I still keep in touch with him. I'll write him every now and then. He'll be nice enough. I'll just, I'll just bounce questions off him. I'll say, hey, do you have time for me to call you and ask you some questions about something I'm doing? Same with another mentor of mine, this guy named Christian Howes. He's an amazing, very successful jazz violinist. Um, from Columbus, Ohio, originally. Again, he's an amazing classical player. He runs a camp in Columbus along with all these other things he does. He does a whole lot of touring, releasing albums, recording. But he uh, somehow finds time to run a camp once a year, too, called the Creative Strings Workshop. And I went to that for the first time when I was 14 as well, I think. That might have been the first time I went. Or maybe I was 16. I'm not sure about that now. I think I was 16 now. But I met him also when I was about uh, somewhere between 12 and 14. He, in the... The other teacher of mine I mentioned, Billy Contreras, they did a show together at the violin shop in town. And that's another big thing there. I've known that guy who runs the violin shop since before I was born because my mom's been going to him and he's been a, a mentor to me as well. But the, he was doing this concert series for a while and these two guys came there and did a show together. And Christian, is he's very good at, at, uh, at the business side of things. He always has been, it seems. <clears throat> so he, of course, was selling his camp at, at that show anyway. But... He also takes a very genuine interest in, in helping develop young players' ability and, and figuring out what they want to do. And it's, it's clearly important to him to help the community grow. His whole thing is helping people learn to be more creative with their instruments. He wants to help classical players or other players as well. But classical players learn to improvise, learn to play jazz, play fiddle styles and things like that. So he was somebody who I was able to you know email every now and then and maybe weeks where he gets back to me or maybe five minutes and he'd write right back I could always call him I've called him I called him a couple weeks ago another good mentor of mine 
basically just I guess one of the biggest things is you can just hound these people pretty much and hope that they get back to you. <laughs> if you're always if you're polite to them, hopefully they'll be polite to you too, you know. So I just always will write people and say, yeah, I just got some questions. I'd love to bounce off you if you have time. That's something I do a lot of time, and usually people will get back to me. Sometimes they don't call me back at all, so it can go either way. That's really cool. Um, something you said earlier, and this is a tip for anybody listening, find the biggest person in your city or in your hometown or someone that's coming in and touring, shoot them an email and ask for a lesson. Absolutely. Say, hey, can you give me a lesson? These guys that come into town or that live in your city, they're, they're being asked to do gigs all the time, whether it's live or session work. And if you ask for a lesson and you prove that you're on par with what they're doing, you might be one of the people to call that they call to fill in for one of their gigs that they can't make because they're getting Absolutely. too many requests. You can't be in three places at once. They need to call out to their people that they know are really good. And if you ask for a lesson, it can kind of be a secret audition for you. Yeah. As well. It's worth the investment, definitely. Absolutely. If nothing else, they, they get to know your face. Even if you're not somebody they would have sub for them, then they get to know your face. Then there was a guy, there's a great fiddle player in town named Aubrey Haney that I've known since I was in high school as well, and, and the gig I'm doing tonight, I'm subbing for him, and he's just somebody that's been a hero of mine. I've learned a lot of his playing, and you know, now I'm at a point where he obviously feels comfortable enough to sub some work out to me, and so... Um, Perfect. Just, See, right here. <laughs> <laughs> right here, real live, in-person example. You mentioned um, fiddle competitions. Yeah. You said you went down to Alabama and met him, met one of your mentors at a fiddle competition. Explain a fiddle competition. Sure. I have no clue what that means. <laughs> well, these, these fiddle contests, they're, they're not a lot of them anymore. There used to be a whole lot of these things. But uh, basically, the way a fiddle contest typically works is a bunch of fiddle players will come together and you'll have several rounds of people playing two or three tunes in each round. You'll play a breakdown or a hoedown, same thing, basically, your, your fast fiddle tune, then a waltz, so they get a, a chance to hear your slower playing, and then a tune of choice, which can be anything, typically anything other than a breakdown or a waltz, though sometimes it can include a breakdown or a waltz. People usually play a swing tune or a rag or uh, some other kind of fiddle tune. You could play a, a shottish or something, but uh, those are, that's how a, a fiddle contest typically works. Here in Nashville, we have one of the the major ones actually is called the Grand Masters Fiddle Competition. There's two major national ones. That's one of them. The other one is in Weezer, Idaho. And that one goes like a week long. I've actually never been out to that one, but that's a pretty massive one and pretty well-respected one. You have a lot of different styles of fiddling as well. You've got your northern kind of canadian influence style, which... Uh, I know a little bit of that music. My mom grew up in upstate New York, so she knows more of that. It's kind of almost more of a, a classical sound on the on the fiddle spectrum. Then you've got kind of your Texas style. Uh, you've got your your southeast kind of more bluegrass influence style, and then your west coast style, which I don't know much about. Those are kind of those things will come together in these contests, depending on where you are. Some people might want to hear one thing more than the other, but oftentimes you'll you'll go to one of those contests. You'll play two or three rounds of of breakdown waltz and tune of choice, and then as you get up and you come come through it, and if you win, you win. If you if you don't, hopefully it was fun. So who judges these contests? Typically, it's other fiddle players. A lot of times now, some of my favorite ones I've been to have been some small ones. I went to one in Loudon, Tennessee, which is about two and a half, three and a half hours east of here, and I think it was uh, a couple local music store owners and uh, a chicken farmer and one other guy that was judging like. They weren't fiddle players at all, and it was awesome. <laughs> I, I was way into that one. It was pretty funny because then you just, you know, then it goes from being a, uh, you don't have to worry as much about trying to impress these fiddle players. You have to think, well, I hope these people like what I play. You yeah. know, it's, it's almost the mind off less of the technical aspect and more of the performance and more of the the sound that you're putting out. Absolutely, and there's some other contests out there where they'll have. They'll have like two or three judges on the judging panel, and then the fourth, third, or fourth. Let's say it's two judges. They'll have two judges, and the third judge will be the audience's vote, basically. Like, you know, they'll yell for whoever they like, and depending on how loud they yell, that vote gets thrown into. I think those are pretty fun, like that. But it's, think, it's an old tradition. I think it just came around from people getting together and, and playing music together, and they started having contests. So. Part of the goal is to help listeners get paid with okay. music. Gotcha. So talk to me, how did you start getting paid with music and how have you continued to find paying gigs and what do those look like? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, some of my first paying gigs were, were doing weddings with my mom. You know, we do 
duo violin gigs and things like that. So that was that was a big opportunity for me there, doing those those kind of gigs. Uh, that's that was all classical playing primarily. When I was in high school, I was lucky enough. I went to the National School of the Arts, and the guitar teacher there. I was in the swing band there, and he he would book us gigs for the school board and uh, other local events. And uh, he would you know he'd get us money for those, It'd be a hundred bucks or something, which is great. You're in high school, just hanging out with your friends, playing playing background music at a cocktail party, and just goofing off, you know. And, uh, so that was an easy easy thing to do as well. When I went off to Berkeley in Boston, I didn't do a whole lot of gigging while I was there. Um, it's more focused on learning a lot so I could get out into the world and gig. But I should have done more gigging as well. It would have been a good good time to be doing that. Since I've been back in Nashville, uh, I've done a whole lot of different kind of work through music. One of the things I've done a lot of is transcription work, so that'll be when somebody somebody will send me audio and they need it written out. And so I've gotten pretty fast at at doing that, I worked for this guy named Mark O'Connor, who was a pretty big fiddle player, and I've helped uh, transcribe a lot of his stuff. He'd say, here's how much money I can give you, I need this by this deadline, and I'd say, okay, and I'd just get to work writing that out. So I did a lot of that transcription work for him and for some other people, so that was a facet to make money in. How did you, how, so let's say I want to do that. Sure. What, what should I do? Advertise it out there on Facebook or something and tell your friends, say, hey, I'm looking to do more transcription work. Uh, if you if you really want to get a lot of it, you can say I'm doing like the first transcription free or first one for you know cheap something like that. Uh, that guy Christian Howes I was talking about, he uh, one of the things he did when he first got out there and was working, he went around to a bunch of different restaurants, Italian restaurants and stuff, other other local places in Columbus, Ohio, where he's from, and he said, hey. Uh, let me do a strolling violin gig for free, and if you like it, we can talk about having this happen again. So that's a, he's like a master of that, of, of generating income from doing things uh, in that manner. He's done that with, with lessons as well. He'll do like, you know, first 10 people who sign up get a free lesson from me, and, and then he's always good at getting return customers like that. So uh, advertising that that's something you're trying to do and very actively pursuing that is, is I think, number one. And you just did it on Facebook when you first started? Well, I didn't. I actually got connected with this guy. I knew this guy distantly, but I also I had quit Berkeley at this point and come back to Nashville because I ran out of money. I had some scholarship that helped, but I didn't have any student debt yet, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to go into student debt, so I said I'll take a semester off and I'll come back to Nashville. But I talked to the head of my department. That was another thing I did a lot of, and I still do that. When I'm up in Boston, I go to my department, and I'll touch base with them and see what's going on there, see there's any work happening that I need to know about. So I was talking to the head of my department at the time, and she said she'd just gotten an email from this guy, Mark O'Connor, and said he needs somebody to transcribe this, this stuff for him. Would you be interested in doing that? And I said, absolutely. Please give him my name. Excuse me. So that's how that got started. Uh, so I was mostly transcribing for him. And while I was doing that, Christian Howes was running a string production company. And so he would go out there, and he'd be online all over the place. On the, he'd you know, subscribe to these different forums and he'd be on there trying to get work for us he he and i and one other guy would primarily do this he would advertise a basically a low budget symphony orchestra and the way it would work is we would either write or somebody else would write it and already have it for us if we wrote the parts or recorded these parts they would they would send it over to us and we would divide it up for each of us would do three violins and two violas and we'd track it at home and we'd send it off, and then they'd put it into their mixes. So his whole thing was that he was trying to offer an in-between for people. Some people would have MIDI strings, and then some people couldn't afford anything else. So this is for people who could afford a little bit. They had a budget to, to add to it, but they couldn't afford a, a symphony orchestra. So he would, he'd would he be out there uh, drumming up work with that, and then he'd send stuff to me. So while I was doing this transcription work for this guy, Mark O'Connor, I was also at home writing and recording string parts for Christian Howes, and that was a major source of my income for uh, probably 2012 to 2015, maybe even 2016, was doing a lot of that. That's all stuff I could just do from home and still be based in Nashville. So I was very thankful for that work and worked hard to keep that. Uh, so while I was doing those things, I was doing some gigs around town with, with other artists. I wasn't doing my own gigs. Everything's been sideman work. I didn't have a whole lot of my own material to do, but uh, I was happy doing the sideman work at the time. Sideman uh, meaning playing for somebody else? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there, uh, 
I would get called to play bluegrass gigs. One of the things I would do, actually, is I'd go to these jams that were happening. There used to be these jams that happened uh, on Wednesday nights at the Five Spot in East Nashville, and that was a pretty killer jam. I'd go out to that and just hang out and play with people. And so that's a good way to get your face around. People would, people would know who you were then and get exchange numbers with them, and somebody can't make a gig. You're on the list to get called, even if it's, you know, you may be the 10th person on the list, but maybe nine people can't make it. So uh, that that was a big factor in that. So I started playing some gigs just from getting my my face out there and playing with these people. And uh, when I was at that fiddle contest in Loudoun that I mentioned, I actually met this girl, Ashley Campbell. She's a great banjo player and singer and songwriter. She's Glenn Campbell's daughter, and she's a pretty killer musician herself. And she called me for a gig uh, not long after that. So she was doing some road stuff, so I started doing a few road dates with her. From doing that, we opened up for these girls, Maddie and Tay, who were doing pretty well. And so when their fiddle player left, they all knew me, so they called me to do that with them so I did that up until about two or three months ago and so that just kind of was all connection based right there basically was that all on tour or just session work that was all on tour with them so actually we were touring so much that I had to stop doing my recording work and I was still doing some transcription work but not as much so they were on the Brad Paisley tour last summer opening up for him which was super fun and those were fun people to work with and uh, it was a good source of income for a while doing that with them uh, I also play some with Leanne Walmack. She calls me when uh, the other guy, Luke Bula, plays with her a lot, too. He's a great fiddle player, but he also plays with Lyle Love. He's got a lot of really good gigs. So sometimes when he's busy with somebody else, they'll call me to, to go on tour with her. So I just always try to make sure I do a really good job on the first the first gig or the first run and really know my stuff well so that I can get called back. For somebody that's never jammed before, gone to a jam session uh, yeah. anywhere, how do you jam? Sure. I guess that's the question. How do you jam? Well, it doesn't hurt to go and listen for a little bit before you join in. It doesn't matter the instrument or the style. Um, people are usually pretty welcoming at those things, I find. Uh, it doesn't hurt to go there and just kind of listen, introduce yourself to people, say you're listening, maybe mention that you'd like to play a little bit, but you're not sure yet, unless you're very confident. If you're confident in doing it, then go on in you know, and sit down. But uh, It's always nice to come at those things from a very humble and modest standpoint and then kind of kind of work in after that so if you're not used to going to a jam you can go to one and observe what's going on oftentimes people will be playing a song if it's a bluegrass jam or a jazz jam or, or an instrumental music jam like that typically what will happen is somebody will play a melody and then they'll kind of go around in the circle each person will play a solo over the same form as the melody and so if you listen to that and kind of catch on to what's going on if it's not if it doesn't feel like a very closed off thing it's usually pretty typical that you can sit in and start playing as well want to make sure that you follow the form that everybody else is following. You don't want to overplay or underplay. You know, It's better to underplay than to overplay, but uh, it can be kind of off-putting to some people if you start doing too much. With your studio work, how, how do you mic your fiddle? When I was doing it at home a lot, I was using these small condenser mics. Uh, it's about 250 bucks. I can't even remember. I think it was a Rode NT5. It's a small condenser mic. You can use them for a lot of different things. They'll use them on... Anything on overheads for drums, close mic for a fiddle. I would use it for, I would I'd probably close mic most of the time, but uh, that's just when I was doing it at home, I would do that. Now, if I go into a nicer studio, sometimes I'll be lucky enough, they'll have you know, $5,000 or $10,000 mic, which will sound great. Um, I've been using these ribbon mics lately that sound awesome. And uh, obviously, that's the studio owns that or the engineer owns that. One of the guys lately has been using the distance between his elbow and his, his fist. He'll make a fist, and the distance between his elbow and the fist is where he'll put the mic from my instrument. So he'll basically put his elbow where my the top of my fiddle is, and then where his fist sits, he'll put the mic there. So that works pretty well. Uh, that was an interesting... Is that over the neck, over the bridge, over... Uh, kind of over the, the F-holes on the instrument, so... So if you see the F-holes where it projects the sound at, he'll kind of put it there, maybe leaning on the on the base of your side of the instrument. But it depends on how it sounds. You know, it depends on the room and if we're isolated or not. Uh, but usually usually I would say it's kind of over the fingerboard, close to the base side of the F-hole, of the F-holes. Okay. Do you know what mic that is that he's using? I can look it up real quick. Okay. Yeah, Go for it. Yeah. Here. Let's see. <clears throat> I have it written down somewhere. It's a Coles 4038. So that Coles 4038 has been a really nice sound on my instrument lately. Um, that one, that guy would just kind of been eyeballing where to put it. Put it that hasn't been doing the the elbow to fist trick like I was talking about. But we kind of eyeball it and then we'll play a little bit, maybe move it a little bit till we find the right spot. But 
uh, depending on on the room and the day, just might be a different place. But that one we've been doing some close micing or some distance on it too, a couple feet away. At the same time, or just no, just interchangeably, depending interchangeably on depending. If I'm doing just one fiddle, also it's not as, it's not as big of a deal. If I'm tracking, if I'm tracking like 24 tracks of strings, then I'll often uh, use a mic in one spot and play maybe two or three tracks in the same spot. Kind of try and change my vibrato a little bit to sound like a different person and change my bowing a little bit. Then I'll maybe move the mic to another place in the room and track over there. Use a different instrument if I have one, a different bow. That's just because I'm, I'm trying. It's funny, you know. You, you would think you want to try and sound as much the same as possible, but if you have a big orchestra of players trying to sound the same, they're all still going to sound different. So when I'm doing that, I try and make myself sound a little bit different so that it sounds like other people trying to sound like one person. <laughs> If that makes sense. Yeah, I I totally didn't even think about that. So I, I have some questions. You mentioned you went on tour for for a while. Yeah. What what is the touring life like for a fiddle player? Like when people think of going on tour, is it really like everyone's on like the bus, or how do you guys travel, or where do you guys stay? How just the yeah. touring aspect? Let's well, talk about that a little bit. All depends. Uh, there's also a, there's a group in Rhode Island that's like a gypsy jazz band, and I'll tour with a lot, uh, or not a lot. I used to tour them a lot more. They don't do a whole lot of touring right now. But when I was out with them, or when I am out with them, they do kind of a, a sprinter van deal. So we'll get in a sprinter van, we'll go, we'll drive long distances, and go play the gig and stay in a hotel that night. And uh, that'll be how that tour works usually. And it's usually they they look pretty long too, pretty long distances between gigs sometimes. So it may be a long day in the car. Um, with more of the pop country stuff, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be on a, on a tour bus, and so you know we'll load on midnight, 1 a.m. the night before the show, and get on the bus. The bus may go eight or 12 hours away. We'll sleep on the bus, get there the next day, get it off, be at the venue, kind of just mill around all day. You might have a sound check time at two, but it might not happen until four or five, depending on what else is going on. Do that sound check, then have the gig, and then kind of be there until everything's done. Load on the bus and keep moving. So that kind of stuff, oftentimes we don't have hotels. That's just living on, on the bus. Last summer, we were pretty busy. We would, we would typically leave on Tuesday or Wednesday night and play a gig, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, sometimes on Sunday, and, or get back Sunday night or get back Monday morning and then kind of do it again. So it'd be, oftentimes it would be five days out of the week like that which gets a little, pretty intense several weeks of that, you know, everybody on a tube rolling down the street gets a little bit a little bit much sometimes, but <clears throat> uh but it's it's that's kind of how that works if that answers that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the the craziest experience that you've had on a tour? Ooh, the cr oh man. Sometimes, you know, people will be uh be out there on the road and when we were when we were out with Maddie and Tay it would be Opening for Brad Paisley, there was another opener as well, and so uh, one of the one of the funniest things actually they did at the end of the Brad Paisley tour, uh, just kind of to mess with Brad Paisley and the band after his after his second to last song. I guess this is his last song, but uh, he comes back out for an for an encore. Essentially, the lights will come down, and this this other guy Tyler Farr, he was the other opener on the act. His whole band came running out with a couch, and they put it on the stage. The lights dim in between the songs, and they ran out with a couch, set it down there. And uh, Tyler Farr's guitar tech brought out a a keg on stage and starts pumping it up. And Brad's out there, and the lights come back on. He sees these guys sitting on the couch behind him, and he sees this guy, you know, about ten feet to his right, pumping up a uh, a, a keg of beer and staring him down like he's going to shoot him with the beer or something. So Brad's over there trying to do the show, you know, thinking probably thinking he's going to get blasted with beer or something in a minute here. But next thing I know, all of all of Tyler Farr's guys are running over there, and they're like doing these keg stands on the on the beer, you know, they're like got guys holding them up by their feet, and they're over there drinking beer in front of fifteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> on the Brad Paisley stage. That's a pretty funny one. And while this is going on, uh, a couple of the other guys and a couple of the, the Maddie and Tay guy band guys are over there disassembling um, Brad's drummer's drum kit, you know, piece by piece while he's playing the last song. So they're taking away cymbal <laughs> here, taking away drum here. And so obviously everybody's having a great time. It's pretty funny. But uh, <laughs> it gets down to I think the drummer had like a – his snare drum and a hi hat, and I think they took his seat away from him too. I think he sat up for a second to adjust something, and then there was no seat under him, so he's just kind of sitting there dealing with one stick. <laughs> that was a pretty funny experience. Good shenanigans. Yeah, That's good awesome. shenanigans. 
that would have been funny to, to see that in the audience. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, bet, yeah. I bet there's videos of it. There's, there's some on YouTube. I looked it up. Yeah, it's pretty oh, funny. Cool. What are some of the realities of touring? I guess words of warning. I guess if people are thinking about touring, it's like, oh, I might. I'm on the fence. What are some of the, the, the not-so-great parts? It's definitely exhausting. Um, it's hard for it not to be exhausting. Just traveling that much is, is tough in general. <clears throat> when you're around the same people for that much and there's not really an opportunity to get away, it doesn't matter how nice they are or who they are, everybody starts to get on everybody's nerves. So that's a definite reality of it. I would say to anybody who's thinking about doing it, make sure it is worth it to you to do it. You know, you don't want to go out there and think, well, I'm not really being paid enough to do this, but I'll, I'll do my best because then you get real resentful really fast and that can turn into a bad attitude. And the last thing you want is somebody with a bad attitude on, on the road. Uh, the bus, if you're on a bus, the bus is going to break down. doesn't matter how new it is. You know, you're doing these 500-mile runs. Uh, <clears throat> these buses are going to are going to break down, so that's a factor. Might uh, might not have any air conditioning for a little while, or you might not be able to turn the AC off for a while either. I remember being on a bus once uh, when I was in high school touring with this guy, and uh, this was an older bus, but they'd gone to Texas right before they picked us up, and they'd gotten all this uh, all this beef and stuff and put it in the the freezer. And the generator had died, and like all these juices and stuff had just leaked down underneath the fridge, and no. it just smelled terrible on the bus. And it took them like a week to figure it out. So oh. that's a, a definite reality of something that can happen there. There's going to be lots of there's going to be lots of maintenance issues with with the bus, uh, time crunches getting places. That's an issue for sure. If you've got a long run to do, if you're playing somewhere, and then if it's a sprinter van kind of deal, you're playing somewhere, and you got to get like four hours to the next place. Doesn't seem that bad, but the next thing you know, it's like, how are we late for sound check right now? We you know somehow we are. We got up super early, and, and we're still not here on time. So uh, it's it's stressful in that sense. Also, not not getting a lot of chances to shower and eat properly. Just you, you know, you totally mess up your system in a lot of ways like that. Uh, so there are some some more difficult things with it. But if you can get past that, it's not too bad. You know, if you feel like you're getting paid properly. And the people you're around aren't people you don't want to be around, then it's definitely worth it, I think. Plus awesome. being on stage. Yeah, that's true. It would be way fun to just be performing in front of people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Feeding off their energy and just, you know, living the dream. Yeah. 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 Also, especially if you have a family or kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Being away from, from them for months on end, depending on how long the tour is or where you're going, I'm sure it can be... You get you get homesick. I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah, and that's tough on your family too. If you, like you said, if you have a wife and, and kids at all, that's that's not a, a very easy thing to do. Obviously, you have to find somebody who'd be okay with you doing that too. <laughs> so, there's some definite factors to consider when you're doing that. What are some bad advice that you hear people say? Mm. <clears throat> bad advice. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess a lot of quote unquote bad advice could be. Not bad advice, depending on who it is or how you're taking it. Sometimes people will say, you know, don't don't take that gig; you'll you'll hate it. You know, well, sometimes it's important to take a gig you're going to hate because it might get you a better gig. Or sometimes in hating a gig, you'll learn to appreciate other ones other ones more. Uh, sometimes the money factor can be very difficult. If you're talking to different people, they'll say, "I wouldn't do it for that," or, or "I would do it for free." Uh, that is always a difficult line to ride hard to say if it's good or bad advice and no matter what somebody tells you there it's kind of always hard to make your own decision on whether to do something like that uh i have heard people say like yeah go out there and just you know play a bunch and and kill it and and sometimes that doesn't end well for people if they don't know what they're doing so but if you know what you're doing and you take that with a a grain of salt and it can work right it could be a, a confident thing so uh, that's a it's a good question. There's definitely a lot of bad advice out there, um, and it's hard to sift through it sometimes. So you've talked a lot about playing fiddle and going playing gigs and going on tour, but there's also something else that's very special about you. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You mean the the world the, the Guinness the World Guinness Record? Yeah. World Record. Yes. Yeah, I have a Guinness World Record for most claps in one minute. Um, I believe it's 1,020 claps in 60 seconds. I did that in 
in uh, 2014. I did it at Berkeley. I went back up there to a studio. I had a friend there who was who had discovered I could do that. I'd been doing it for a couple of years, but never officially. <clears throat> and she said, "You can do this, and you haven't set the record. What are you doing?" You know. And so she said, "I'll film it. Let's let's." Let's sim- you know submit this to Guinness. And so I was looking at their guidelines and everything. And at the time, I don't know how it is now, but uh, typically, my understanding is that Guinness gives you two op- options depending on what you're doing. You can you can either hire an adjudicator from Guinness to come out and and uh, authenticate the record in person. But I think I remember looking at that, and it was going to be thousands and thousands of dollars to have to fly somebody um, over to come adjudicate that. The other option I had was to have two professional sound engineers record and sign off on my, on my record. And then we could send all those materials into Guinness and then Guinness would process it and they'd take a look at everything and they would have my witnesses that had signed off on it. And then they would also go through it and check it themselves. How do you how do you check how many times you have clapped in one minute? There there can't be someone just counting it. Well, what we did was we recorded it into a Pro Tools session, and uh, we hoped that we could beat map it out with, with the built in stuff in Pro Tools, but that wasn't accurate. So, yeah, we had to go and count each individual clap and make sure it counted as a clap. And some sounded like claps, and some sounded like that, and didn't count. Yeah. So. Uh, I missed a few in there, so that's what it got to 1,000 to 20. Initially, I was going to do 975. I actually recorded the record at 975 in the minute. I was going to submit that. But I realized at that point I was doing about 16 per second. If I could do one more second of clapping, I would you know, break 1,000. I thought, well, somebody's going to break my record at some point. I might as well try and be the first person to break 1,000. So I was doing it with a metronome. I would do it with a metronome in my ear so I could subdivide each, each clapping. I would, I would count 16. You know, I'd count 8 and know that I was getting two per per click, basically, and um, or two per count in each second, so I would know I was doing 16 at a pace. So I bumped the metronome up, I think, to 64 BPM and did it like that and and processed that and submitted that. We got the, the we all agreed on the number 1,000 to 20 and sent that into Guinness, and it was about a year later when they had finished processing it, and they said, you know, congratulations, you're approved. You have the Guinness World Record for most claps in a minute. Which is so do you get like a plaque, <laughs> an award? What, what I do, you- yeah. They, they gave me a plaque. Um, they're a big certificate basically for it. People always ask, they said, do you get money for that? And I said, well, no, but uh, you can get gigs out of it. <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing, but there you are. Get clapping? I got a clapping gig in Hong Kong what? in 2000, I guess it was 2016. This company over there contacted me to come over for 10 days and clap at shopping malls, essentially, and, <laughs> and do clapping demonstrations. They were having like their their 10-year anniversary of their company, and so their theme was, give me 10. Like, give me 5, give me 10. And so they were looking for different things, and they found this you know, world record for most claps. And so they contacted me and then negotiated the contract with them. I actually called my mentor, Christian Howes, and he helped me negotiate that contract. And they paid me well and paid for me to be there and flew me over, put me up, and paid me pretty well to, to be in Hong Kong for 10 days. I'd never been to Asia. I didn't think I would ever go to Hong Kong or anything like that. So that was a pretty incredible opportunity to get through that. It's kind of funny. Uh, the whole time I was there, I was like, I want to be playing music while I'm here, and I'm here clapping. You know, I thought if I was going to get anywhere in the world, I'd be <laughs> playing the violin, and instead I'm there clapping. But uh, amazingly enough, I had a friend who I had met once this, this acquaintance of mine was a saxophone player he came through nashville once and we had a mutual friend i met him and my friend reminded me that he lived there like two days before i went there i didn't think i was going to know anybody there so i wrote him a quick message and he he showed me around and was able to actually get me involved in the music scene a little bit while i was there which was fun but. that's cool will you give us an example of your your world record clapping sure sure thing. okay I'll, I'll start a little slower and build up to it <laughs> that is crazy. Looking at this on my computer, it's wow. It's nuts. Can you? Uh, it might be. It might be hard. Mm-hmm. But can you give us a lesson? Sure. For those who can't see us. Yeah. But we can be here. Okay. Give us a lesson in because it looked like you were doing a double clap. I am. Yeah. With my my technique, I I do. Uh, I get two hits per arm motion, basically, which is why I was able to 
go fast enough to break the record. I saw the first record holder, the original guy. I think I was a sophomore in high school, and I watched a video of this guy on MySpace videos, which is pretty much the only thing I remember about MySpace now, which is funny. I don't even remember that MySpace videos being a thing except for this. And I remember seeing this video of this guy named Kent French, and he was the original guy to set the record. And he uh, he did he did something where he was clapping. He kind of had his his hands higher in the air and his elbows together, and he would go side to side. So basically. Uh, you want to think of it like a, like a golf clap, you know, like you're bringing one hand to the other, so right to the left, into the palm, and then you want to bring your right one over and bring your left one to the palm of that. So you're kind of alternating side to side like that. So he was doing it higher in the air, and that was a little weird for me, so I kind of put my elbows out and got my hands a little closer together and went side to side like that. It took me about a week to figure that out, actually. And everybody in school was like, here comes Eli down the hall, is trying to make some fast clapping noises again. But, You'd practice uh, this in school? Yeah, I'd walk down the hallway <laughs> trying, to, trying to clap. And, awesome. Uh, so, so it's basically, you know, you like clap your right hand to your left, and as your right one's coming back to the left, you want your, you, or as your right hand is coming back, you want your left hand to follow it and clap. So they're kind of, they're kind of moving side to side with each other, One's just catching up to the other one rather quickly. And so that's the first step of it then. So once you get a little faster with that, kind of get going. Yeah. And while I was practicing this, I was trying to do kind of rhythms. I would do stuff like that, just kind of get rhythms out of it. And then I started hitting kind of like my, my lower palm wrist area into my other palm, oh. just kind of as a, I don't know how I started doing that, but somehow I started doing that, so that's a little bit harder to explain over over a, a podcast maybe, but you're basically yeah. bringing kind of like the top of your wrist and the bottom of your hand into the bottom of your hand on the other side, so that'll hit there, and then from there it pulls straight down to the fingertips on the same hand. That probably makes no sense at all, <laughs> but... Yeah, exactly. You're, you're doing it there, and from there, so you're like it resets. Your fingers. I cut cut my fingers a little bit, yeah. And from there, it resets without having right. to lift at all yeah. to the other hand. Yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. So, mm-hmm. I so then, got it. so then, this, which is just one, you can do the same amount of arm work and just cup your hands and get twice as fast. Yeah. That's, crazy. That's it. Yeah, you guys are both doing it right now. It's actually not terribly hard once you learn it. I've had a couple people to do it, and now I'm kind of like scared. I'm like, whoa, everybody's learning to do this. But someone's going to start. He was to doing. He was doing this. Yeah. So you've seen you've seen his video yeah. then. Um, the hardest thing do it. though is you got to do it for a minute, and that's that's still kind of tough to do it for a whole minute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. I can't imagine doing like getting the actual clap like the. Yeah, the but you're hit. doing it right now. That's good. Awesome. <laughs> I'm just like rubbing my hands together now. Now everybody <laughs> can listen to this, try to look up a video, and beat your record. Yeah. Well, it's true they can. I did one. I, was, uh, <laughs> Maybe we should cut that out then. <laughs> well, I was in, in London with Maddie and Tay uh, last summer, and I made an extra stop by the Guinness World Records headquarters. I just wrote them on Facebook because they were pretty active on there. I said, hey, I have the record for this. Can we do a, uh, anything? And the guy's like, yeah, come in. We'll do a Facebook Live. You know. So I came in and did a little... Little interview with them, and we were doing it, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, this is going to be seen by a lot of people." So I'm like, "Great, there goes my record." Great. But fortunately, it hasn't been broken yet. I know it's just a matter of time, but yeah. while I have it, I'm trying to capitalize on it as much as I can. Have you done other clapping gigs I, besides the Hong Kong? I haven't. I'd like to. I almost had a commercial in Beijing that fell through. They they wrote me about it, and I was writing them back, and then timing wise, it didn't work out because they were starting their 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 New Year or something. I think during that time, it's like totally different for several weeks so that didn't work out i would have liked to have done that um but i'm I'm hoping to do more more gigs like that it's kind of a weird thing to do but it's pretty fun to do and uh yeah one of my friends pointed out he says you know you're a really good violin player but you have this record that says you're you have to certify this certification from guinness world records says you're the best at this and it's the just, world. It's yeah. It's it's yeah. weird. It's weird. I would I would wouldn't think that I would think of it that way, but uh, but That's I guess funny. I do have like a credential for that that allows me to do some other things. They're pretty cool. That was so random. Yeah. Um, yeah. So cool. Uh, we officially have 
the best, the fastest hand clapper <laughs> in the world on this podcast, right here. Guinness World Record Podcast, we can now call it. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> if you were asked to give a TED Talk today mm-hmm. on something that you're not known for, what would that topic be? Probably video game music, because that's, that's like the nerdiest thing I can say right now, but... Uh, uh, when I was 12 years old, I decided I wanted to write video game music for a living. And I still want to do that at some point. And I kind of keep my foot in that world. I have some friends that work in that industry, but it's not something I, I do at all. But I've just, like, I've got a bunch of sheets at home where I've just, like, analyzed video game songs written out. I'm actually working on a project right now of all these bluegrass um, bluegrass instruments covering famous video game songs. And so that's something I've been really obsessed with for a long time. So I could I feel like I would be confident in doing a a TED Talk about the evolution of and implementation of video game music. That would, I would, I would love that. Yeah. I have a bunch of friends that would completely, that would <laughs> watch that, like, immediately. Watch that for sure. Who do you reach out to when you need answers or advice? Uh, it would be my parents, for sure, and the, the mentors I've mentioned. Christian Howes is, is somebody I call pretty frequently if I need a, if I have a question about something. Um... Locally as well, this guy Fred Carpenter who runs the violin shop. If it's like a, if it's a country thing or something or a bluegrass kind of gig around town, I'll I'll ask him about stuff. But I I'll probably always bounce stuff off my my mom and dad before anything else. My brother as well. He's done pretty well for himself in the business world, so he's somebody I'll bounce questions off of. What's an inexpensive purchase that has had the most impact in your life? Uh, that would probably be. That microphone I was talking about earlier, not the not the nice ribbon mic, but the the two hundred fifty dollar um, uh, small condenser mic. That you know, two hundred fifty dollars I guess is not a small purchase, but it is relatively small. And ended up having that microphone ended up generating you know tens of thousands of dollars of work for me for several years. Basically, that and the the notation software I use. That Finale Finale is what it's called. It's the music notation software I used. So those are probably the two biggest things that helped me in terms of smaller uh, financial purchases. Which which level of finale do you use? Uh, twenty fourteen point five, I think, is what it's called. So is that is that what you mean? Or? Um, I I think there's because uh, there's the there's the free version right, that finale I've used notepad. before. Notepad, that's what so it's called. I started using Finale Notepad uh, when I was in middle school, and I loved it. I used it through high school, and then when I went to Berkeley and Boston, I got the full version as part of my tuition, and oh, then right. you know it was a couple years later I, I upgraded it as well so i was always doing these workarounds to try and get time time changes and keys to nature changes and stuff from the free version but uh it was worth buying the, the full one and let me do some other things like like the uh, time changes and stuff if someone's wanting to get into um transcribing yeah music would you recommend they start with the free version then upgrade when they feel ready or just get the yeah. free ver- get the upgraded because it's worth it i would start with the free version there's a couple other ones out there too i'd start with finale notepad and check it out sibelius also uh has some stuff out there that's like kind of the major competitor to finale um there's also a thing online called noteflight.com and noteflight is a music notation software that's completely browser based so i don't know if it runs off of flash or html um but it uh, it's pretty cool. I've checked it out a little bit, and they actually offer a subscription-based version of it, so you could check that one out for free. And then, if you're interested in the more uh, in-depth version of it, you could pay a, I think it's seven or eight dollars a month or something like that to to try that. So there's more stuff popping up all the time now. I'm curious about. I'm really excited for when they get something that works really well on an iPad. You know, they've they've got some stuff like that now, but I think it's pretty pretty buggy from what I've heard. But once that is totally figured out it'd be awesome just draw write stuff in really quick and have it have it be there but for now finale is my preferred usage and so i would start with i would check out finale notepad and in the competitors free versions and and see what is preferable to the user we can link that in the show notes um how can people find you and know what you're up to uh, then go to my website, elibishopmusic.com. It's poorly maintained, but it's I'm I'm working on it. And my uh, my email's on there. People can always email me. Uh, I post some stuff on Facebook as well. But I would say most of the stuff I try to keep updated on my my website. And uh, yeah, great. And so if somebody, if some tech guy out there <laughs> is interested in developing an iPad app for notation, they could call you up as a consultant. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Awesome. 
Well, it's been a pleasure. It yes, has. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the show. Guys. Thank you. Hey, just a few more things before you take off. First of all, you can find links to everything we discussed in the show notes. This episode was brought to you by our wonderful patrons. If you want to learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family and how you can unlock behind the scenes content, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash inside music city. If you enjoy this episode, you can go to our Facebook page and let us know. You can comment on posts, pictures, videos, anything really. Our Facebook is inside music city. Be sure to give us a like. And finally, please, please, please forward this episode to someone you feel like would enjoy listening to or learning from our conversation today. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. You're awesome. Yeah.